And so by the time you get to 2026, which is kind of around the time Phil and I have forecast the peak of the current cycle, you know, you, you, often it's people who suddenly they cut can no longer hold on to their views, which have been proven not to work for a few years, and then they change. And that's almost sometimes a signal that, you know, things have got to the top. Every cycle, there's always something that sucks in people's hard-earned money, and it goes way over the top. These things are almost designed to to part you from your money. So, so you do need to pay attention. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I've got a special guest on today. I've got Akil from Property Share Market Economics. We are going to get into the housing cycle, the economic cycle, and answer your questions, which you posted on my Twitter and on YouTube. Before we get into it, make sure you hit the like button down below if you want to see more of this content and stay up to date. Obviously, we're doing a lot with cryptocurrency and the stock market, and there's going to be times where we need to be rolling our profits into other areas of the market. Remember to hit the subscribe button, bell notification icon, so you guys can be updated with the content. I'll cross over to Akil. Thank you very much for your time today, mate. Uh, it's been I've been wanting to do this interview for so long. Thanks for having me. Yeah, anytime, anytime. I have to do a few more. Uh, so yeah, I just mentioned at the beginning, you're the co-founder with Phil Anderson at, uh, at Property Share Market Economics. The guys on my channel know I've talked with Kathy quite often. She's also um, works with you guys at Property Share Market Economics. Uh, just give us a little background and then we want to get into all the questions people had about real estate, the market, is it is it heating up? Are we going to crash in 2021? We've got a lot of questions, but yeah, just give us a, a quick background to, to yourself and property share market economics. Very nice to be on your channel. Thanks for inviting me. So um, I've been studying economic cycles uh, and so on pretty much since um, the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and I got into it partly because my family's business was having a pretty difficult time. And I didn't really feel the explanations for why that was were satisfying. So I thought I'm going to try and understand what's going on uh, in a more fundamental way and then um, develop some kind of knowledge to help my family in the future and other families and businesses and investors make sure that they don't get burned during such periods and also take advantage of the of the uh, economic booms that also take place Um because you know, often people miss them. They, you know, they they jump in too late. You know, often near the end, um, and you know, always have a, a sense of FOMO that they need to get in, and it's often at the wrong time. So I wanted to, you know, really help people um, address that. And I came across Phil's book um, around 2008. Changed my life, I have to say. Um, really explaining and detailing the economic cycle in the U.S. from 1800. Um, and soon after we started working together on various things and uh, property share market economics was in some ways a culmination of that collaboration. But, you know, we've got big plans for the next few years. So really very much looking forward to it. And the book, of course, is Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking. In terms of the, the business coming forward, it's property share, share market economics. The guys know I talk about it a lot. I'll repost your stuff. It just makes so much sense in the cycle. And that's essentially how I found it in about 2012, uh, 2012 and 2013. That's when I started uh, following Phil for the first time. I was into the property cycle doing investing and I was just wondering, everyone can tell me when to buy, but why can't someone tell me when to sell? And it's because most people don't have a definitive answer of that. And I noticed that with maybe an interview that we can chat about today, it was uh, Harry Dents, who, who actually wrote a bit of a quote or a blurb on the back of Phil's book. I mean, you've spoken to Harry Dent before. Uh, I know of him. I've not spoken know to him directly. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll have to get a meeting one day, but I know Phil definitely has. I don't understand how we can have two completely different views of the market. Harry Dent saying the market is going to crash by up to 90%. This is the stock market and property by about like 60%. Yet Phil is saying we're going to go up into 2026. Yeah. I mean, from your studies, how does this happen and how do we get so confused? Well, I mean, it's obviously, it's often the case that um, people have very different views about things. Um, yeah. I'd say, I mean, look, I, I don't want to um, uh, be too dismissive of people's sincerely held views, but I found over the years that Harry um, is kind of always calling for a bit of a crash. I mean, he certainly was doing this in 2015 and 16 and uh, and certainly in 2017, he released a book called Zero Hour, which was talking about a uh, an Im imminent crash, uh, which didn't happen. Uh, I'm not sure actually that he called the crash last year. I don't know. I have to, I have to check. Um, and he's he's calling a crash again. Look, at some point he will be right because you know economies do go through boom and bust, and 
you know, we will at some point towards the end of the decade, in our view, have a major sort of financial economic crisis. Um, and so he, if you know, if he keeps his forecast kind of ongoing and he updates the dates every year, he'll be right eventually. Um, now, why, you know, from, from my point of view, um, he kind of has some very good, interesting data on demographics and so on. And clearly, you know, where you're in an economic sort of situation where you've got declining population, that's not great for growth. And if people lose confidence, then, you know, things can crash. And so I feel that, you know, that's a very good, important piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only one. Um, and as Phil details in his book, and I've, as I've written in for, for, for various newsletters and for probably share market economics, um, you know, uh, it's really ultimately the economic cycle um, is based upon understanding how it links to the property market and how bank lending is linked to uh, people uh, taking on mortgages and, and borrowing to acquire commercial real estate. Uh, and then understanding that at some point, after you've had a good few years of you know, growth and prosperity that get turns into speculation, goes over the top. Um, and then you, that's when you get uh, a major uh, economic crisis. Now, the, the thing that confuses everyone is that in the middle of that sort of expansion, you often get a, a mid-cycle recession. And at the mid-cycle, people think, oh my gosh, you know, the crisis is about to return. Um, and, you know, we're going to have another global financial crisis or another Great Depression. Um, and because you haven't had the major period of speculation before that, you tend to find that what the government does to stimulate the economy works. And then that sets off the second half. And I think it's almost because people have a sense of confidence that, you know, the government knows how to manage the economy. That's why you get a major boom. Um, I think Harry doesn't understand that part of the picture. I don't sure he understands the significance of real estate. He doesn't understand the significance of government action at the mid cycle. And so he, he takes a few different facts and in my view, kind of sort of puts two and two together and gets, I don't know, 56 or something. <laughs> so we, well, we uh, get so a crash in one. every year leading up to it. Yes, we'll get a crash every year, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm probably being a bit facetious here. And I, you know, I know some people follow him very closely. I mean, um, I'm putting you on the spot here. So to the, yeah, to no, the that's, viewers, that's it's... fine. And look, I'm, I'm happy to be, and I'd be happy to debate some of these things with him or with other people who would, would like to, um, you know, take that point of view. But I mean, I think the reality is that people who are often calling crashes every year, it's almost the year that they decide to update their views is the year that you do actually get the crash. And so, you know, in 2021 yeah. crash doesn't happen 2022 crash doesn't happen and so by the time you get to 2026 which is kind of around the time phil and i forecast the peak of the current cycle you know you, you, often it's people who suddenly they cut can no longer hold on to their views which have been proven not to work for a few years and then they change and that's almost sometimes a signal that you know things have got to the top you saw that a little bit sort of just by the by you saw that a little bit at the start of 2020 when you had people like ray dalio you know the really big hedge fund manager and I suppose now you'd say he's a business guru and you know his chief financial officer at his, his hedge fund Bridgewater kind of uh, said in, in Davos you know the, the World Economic Forum that um, the business cycle as we know it is you know no longer present. Um, I mean there was a certain nuance around what he was saying but you know it made a good headline and that yeah. almost caught the very top of the market. I've noticed Ray Dalio as well has gotten really into the the bear frame of mind and it, it tends to, I wasn't around in 1982, but it reminds me of the stories I've read about Dalio in 82, com, coming from his own mouth where he believed in 1982 that the market should crash and he was looking to short it and then it was literally the bottom before it took off into 1987. And so I wonder how he's doing that again. And th these are sort of the biggest names that are like you said, business gurus, finance gurus, investment gurus online now, and a lot of people follow them quite religiously. Yeah, Ray Dalio's, Warren Buffett's, and then Harry Dent now with the every day's a crash. Yeah, I mean, it's in, I think they have a certain view of the world which um, doesn't, in, well, in my view, doesn't is not complete for the reasons I outlined. Mm. Um, I mean, I, you know, to be fair to, to Ray Dalio, he's obviously made a lot of money. He's he's able to 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 recognise that he might have called something wrong and, and changed his mind and, and go the other way. So. So he, you know, he still does well out of out of the boom. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a good sign of an investor as well. That's yeah. Exactly. yeah. The 18.6 year cycle is something that I talk about. And if people aren't aware of it, if you were talking about a, a call at the end of 2026, do you just want to quickly recap that? Like, what is it? How do we get there? Where are we? Yeah. Why is so, why is it the cycle that we follow? You know, there's so many other things out there. Why is this the one? Sorry. Why well, is this the one? Um, gosh, well, maybe I'll start with that. So, um, <laughs> you know, the most important asset in our economies is our land. Uh, by okay. far and away, the most valuable asset, much bigger than the stock market, much bigger than the bond market and, and so on. Uh, and most of what banks do is lend against real estate, you know, for collateral, for loans. You know, if you want to buy a house or or if you want to start a business, often you have to pledge uh, pledge your you know piece of property um, to to acquire that. So so the biggest asset attracts all the bank lending in an economy, um, and uh, and so we're all basically exposed to the ups and downs of the real estate market. Now, why does why does land keep going through boom boom and buses? Well, because when economies grow and get more prosperous, when government puts in infrastructure, when people move into an area, property prices go up. Um, and it therefore makes it a very good investment because, you know, in, in general, our economies tend to grow. We tend to get wealthier over time. Um, and because it's a good investment, you know, people jump in uh, and that can go over the top. As with any asset class, it's just that in the biggest asset class in an economy, um, uh, it can go way over the top. Uh, and so you get these sort of periods of boom and bust. Um, historically, we have seen, uh, and the evidence is, if you care to take a look at it, very clear, yeah. um, that for the last 200 plus years in the US and the UK, I mean, we focus on those two countries because they have the most long running data, they're the economies that have, you know, in some sense has been the most stable over that period, whereas other countries like, you know, Germany has, you know, been you know, split apart and reunified. You know, other countries were under dictatorships, or um, in the case of say, you know, Japan, they were ultimately, you know, very severely damaged in the Second World War and had to rebuild. So, but the U.S. and the U.K. in have had that stability. So you can see the data um, very clearly. Most reliable Australia, data. Most reliable data. And Australia is also part of that picture, except that in 1800 it was, you know, maybe not quite the great economy that it is today, uh, shall we say? So. Um, you, in, in those countries, you see since 1800, um, 18 year kind of real estate cycle, things start pretty slowly. Um, you know, people have, uh, are recovering from the prior crisis. You get a few years of recovery, shall we say, but relatively slow and steady growth. Um, uh, as that sort of picks up, you know, you, you might get a bit of a mini boom into a mid cycle recession. Just, you know, sometimes things can go a little bit too far. Business can expand too much. Um, and so there's a bit of a pullback into a recession. After the recession, um, you know, well, sorry, during the recession, governments tend to stimulate the economy. And then um, that works. You get out of the recession because you've not had the major crisis. And the second half is a, is a boom. The first half is roughly five to seven years. The second half, the boom is five to seven years as well. The final couple of years of the second boom is typically a really manic period where things are really going over the top. Everyone's getting FOMO, everyone's jumping in. Um, banks are very happy to lend you whatever money you would like to buy, whatever you want sort of thing. Um, goes way over the top. Uh, at some point it peaks and then it, you have a major collapse and, and, and crash. And typically in the crash, uh, at the end of the cycle, um, if, you, if you take the US market back to 1800, the stock market has typically fallen about 50% in, in price. Um, property markets in real terms goes down about 20 to 30 percent but that disguises from that peak, from that peak typically okay. and average yeah. now some yeah. some areas it might go down less i suppose at the center of major cities which are still growing you know because people ultimately need somewhere to live so some might not go down as much but other places might go down much more significantly if there's been a huge amount of speculative building way above you know, reasonable estimation of demand, which is often what you get during a boom, you know, the price of real estate can collapse much more significantly. And so then, you know, the banking system collapses, they stop lending to businesses, businesses fail because, you know, they rely on working capital and so on. Uh, they lay people off, you know, people stop spending, et cetera, et cetera. And that process takes a number of years to play out. Um, typically four years if, if, um, if the government is relatively quick to act, if it's not, then it can take a bit longer.
currently we're in that mid cycle section we've seen that first five to seven years which was i think it was about seven or eight years and now we're yeah, in that it's middle a bit section longer, it's a bit longer this time yeah yeah and where did the bottom right, so start yeah, we've, from? We've, we're emerging from the mid-cycle recession now. Emerging from it. When, when did the mid-cycle, oh, sorry, when did the this cycle begin? What year, month? Well, it, it so the US tends to lead other economies by about six months to a year. So I think the US probably started around 2011, 2010, possibly. I mean, there's never one particular day that it starts. You know, it's sort of a, it's a process of starting. Um, yeah. Uh, the US, sorry, the UK, maybe 2012. Um, Australia is similar, I think. Similar, yeah. I mean, Australia, the, the thing was a little bit muddied because, um, well, first of all, Australians saw the crisis coming. Uh, and so you're able to get in stimulus before it sort of had arrived. And then in, in chi China and the US both enacted enormous um, stimulus packages in 2009. Um, and that really, I mean, you know, that really saved the global economy from something more severe. Uh, what it also did was pushed up demand for commodities in, in China in particular. And um, the commodities boom in between 2009, 2011, obviously had a very beneficial effect on, on you know, vast parts of Australia, um, you know, particularly around Perth and, and other areas. And so, so, you know, people say, oh, well, we didn't really have a downturn. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that in in sort of more, um, say, peripheral economies of communities where there'd been a bit too much property speculation, actually things were pretty, pretty grim for a bit of time. Um, but it, you know, you didn't necessarily see the severe downturn that we did in the UK and in in, in the US uh, for that yeah. reason. Uh, but that's yeah. not to say that the next one won't, you know, affect Australia more significantly. And that's what I was just writing some notes down here, looking at what's happened in the past that 20 to 30 percent from the peak obviously roughly speaking some areas less some areas a bit more why could these this next time uh, could the prices fall further because of the amount of money printing we're always led back to that chart of last year 2020 had 25 or 30 percent of the world's money printed or the us's money printed in that single year alone compared to the entire history could we not see a bigger downturn in property prices after this peak in 2026? Uh, yes. I mean, it, it really depends on what will happen between now and mm. 2026. So, uh, so, so, I mean, just, just for clarity about a US money printing, quote unquote, um, I mean, we can get into that now or in another video. Um, I mean, if you ask people to sit at home um, and do nothing for a year or so, um, if you want to keep that capacity in your economy, you're going to have to find, you know, you're going to have to pay to do it uh, and so that's basically why the amount of money that the u.s government spent reached that level it wasn't to bail out banks as it was in 2008 it was simply to keep capacity in the economy such that when we got through the pandemic things could start up again and you know what we have found actually is that you know in the uk we're now i think half of us are now vaccinated and things are starting to open up and there is actually all that spare capacity in the economy which so the rebound this year will be pretty significant. They think the UK will record its highest level of growth in 70 years uh, later. This year. I mean, obviously, we lost a lot of things last year. And so we won't, might not necessarily be back to where we were um, at the start of 2020. But it just goes to show that, you know, in that sense, um, the stimulus packages did what they were intended to do. Um, what what I think what the what will push uh, a property, a period of property speculation into overdrive and take it way over the top is the amount of money that banks will print. So banks, when they lend, print money as well. Um, it's the amount of money that banks will print over the next five to six years. And if, if that goes way over the top, then of course, when that whole process stops, then prices can come down uh, very significantly. Right. So yeah, we've got to wait to see what happens in those years because then we can ad adjust or we can forecast a little better of maybe how far it could fall yeah the bigger the boom the bigger the bust is typically kind of true a good, good way of thinking about it a lot of people ask how can we afford to pay higher prices from this point i know where i am in australia sydney melbourne you might be familiar with the prices here being in the uk uh, yeah they're, they're, they're high just like london <laughs> a, a, a million's kind of like that's sort of where you're sitting now sydney melbourne easy gold coast where i am yeah, you want anything reasonable it's sort of like 800 a million mil 
how does it go any further from this? They're at zero now. Um, wages haven't grown. Yeah. How do, how, how do the prices go up further? Well, I mean, I suppose, um, I mean, wages won't won't always be zero. I mean, if, if you have a commodities boom, as you tend to get in the second half of each cycle, I would imagine that is quite bullish for the Australian economy. Um, uh, and obviously, if people can't afford to service their debt, then they can't afford bigger loans. But, um, you know, we have historically, I mean, I think in the late 80s was a good example of that. I think we were paying more, even though prices were lower um, and loans to values were lower. Uh, people were paying more of their disposable income in, in mortgage payments than they are now. Uh, so there is room, as far as I understand, for things to go up. I think the real killer is, is firstly, will banks be willing to lend you that much? Because they're still, you know, to a certain extent, you know, not, not going, f there's not a free for all, at least not from what I can see. It's based yeah. here in London, vis-a-vis uh, -vis London, but also uh, what I can see in Australia. Um, uh, and I haven't so, eased... They haven't eased the regulations yet in Australia, but I think well, that's exactly. that's coming. Yeah. 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 I suppose the real the real sort of um, problem is how do you raise the deposit? You know, because you've got to have ten percent down or twenty percent down, and you know, if it well, then they just million, re they reduce the deposit, right? That's what right. We've seen so that's in the, the past. thing. So that's the thing. Yeah. So you can access you can access the property market with a smaller deposit and a bigger loan. If if interest rates are low and you know you you have a certain level of them being fixed and you can you can afford them on day one well presumably if if you're in a decent job you'll be getting more money over time and so it becomes a bit easier you you know i mean it, it's mostly the case in london that if you buy you're typically buying with a partner so it's two incomes that are servicing um servicing that loan uh, and so there are there are basically lots of different forces that enable you to do that i mean clearly if if wages collapsed uh, which i don't think they will but if they did and if interest rates went from zero to five percent overnight that would have a an immediate and massive impact uh, on the property market but these things tend not to happen quite in that way and for interest rates rising when does that happen people are sort of saying next year we should be starting interest rate rises and at what point does the interest rate have to get to to really put us into stress from our current levels because that's obviously going to play into it people are going to say well it has to crash as soon as they see one increase or two increases or to get to a percent it's like time for it to crash and i guess that's how every year we get this thing saying property market has to crash property market has to crash so back to my question where I went on my right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so when, when will I mean, that interest rate rise and about how much does it have to get to? I mean, it's, it's quite hard to say, really. I mean, mm. so interest rates tend not to go, I mean, not, not at this point in the cycle, they don't go from zero to five in a short space of time. Um, and it also depends on what other countries are doing. I mean, the US has basically said that it's prepared to see an element of inflation before it starts thinking about raising rates. Uh, and, you know, I'd imagine that other countries will think along the same lines uh, th you know they tend to kind of follow each other to a certain extent that i mean i think that's the first point so um you know they may delay interest rate rises for as long as possible i mean the second thing is it's undeniably true that after a decade of really low interest rates you know we've got used to it you know we've got used to things being very low and so it probably won't take much of an increase for things to then start to look a bit shaky now the, the, the immediate impact of that depends on are people paying variable rate uh, mortgages, uh, so variable rates of interest on their mortgage. Uh, so are they immediately going to feel the increase uh, or is that delayed a little bit uh, because they're on fixed rates? I mean, we, most people are on fixed rate loans in the UK, for example, and US mostly fixed rates so, and long term fixed rates. So it may not have an immediate consequence. Um, and then the other thing is during the middle of a boom, even though rates might be rising in the capital markets, um, banks are also competing with each other to do mortgage business. And so they may not pass on uh, interest rate increases immediately onto their customers because they want to grab market share. So these things don't happen straight away and in the way that people necessarily think they will. Um, sure. What we do know is that at some point it becomes too much for an economy to handle. So pr property prices have gone too high, rents have gone too high, interest rates are starting to kick up. 
um, inflation is is becoming a thing, people are then people then start to spend a bit less, and so you don't have the same level of increase as you did in the previous years. And it's even almost the fact that the rate of increase is slowing. So you're not falling. It's just that you're not growing as much that starts to kick off a chain reaction, which then brings about the, eventually brings about the, the crash. But that takes gotcha. some time to play out. And that's why we're sort of looking that later part of the decade, mid to late 2020s. We've got an idea of the 18 year cycle, why it is, where are we in the cycle? When did it start? When is it looking likely to end? Uh, I'll cross over to some questions that I had from the community that I put up on Facebook, oh, sorry, on uh, YouTube. Uh, you won't see them on the screen, but I'll just, I'll read them out here. Yeah, if you've got the answers to them, great. If not, <laughs> we'll move on to the next one. There, there are a lot to do with the, the housing market prices, people first time getting in. Uh, because my channel is quite heavily, heavily focused on cryptocurrency as well, people are kind of wondering, do these cycles meet up and can you tell when the cryptocurrency cycle will end i might start with that one with the crypto stuff and then get into the the property questions do you know much about the crypto cycle and how that will work in with the overall property market being as it's the biggest in the world um i don't know i don't know anything about the crypto cycle actually um i mean there's bitcoin sorry to comes... disappoint <laughs> <laughs> it, um as Bitcoin becomes more mainstream, it will follow most asset classes and ultimately will get tied to to the real estate cycle, uh, I'd imagine, in some way. Um, Maybe to the commodity cycle like gold and just have these super long cycles, but it's quite new. Yeah, possibly. It depends on what function it plays. I mean, I mean, maybe if it becomes a sort of a safe haven reserve currency type thing, then, 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 then possibly in times of economic stress, it will... It will gain. It will gain in the way that gold does, um, uh, and and also then start to tend to move a bit inverse to the U.S. dollar. So, uh, yeah, I mean that's a possibility. I mean, I think in general, cryptocurrency they're doing some fantastic and wonderful, slightly weird things. Look, I mean, every cycle. I will say this uh, as a, as a bit of a warning, I suppose. I mean, I'm not knocking the idea of cryptocurrency by any stretch, but every cycle there's always something that sucks in people's hard-earned money um, uh, and it goes way over the top and it's often you know the people who are youngest and newest who are the ones who most enthusiastically embrace the new kind of thing um, and it's just a warning that um, you know these things are almost designed to, to part you from your money so so you do need to pay attention you do need to be careful you do need to you can you can believe the hype about you know decentralized finance and uh, and all that kind of stuff, um, but these stories are themselves rarely you know you rarely told everything you need to know. So um, so you know I, I I I suspect that over the next few years, cryptocurrency will both fuel the boom and also be one of the main um, victims of the crisis. Not not in every in necessarily every single coin. Um, as yeah. I said, Bitcoin might have a different function within all that or some other, you know, Litecoin or something else. Um, but uh, that is that is the historical evidence. And so this is my bet that this would be part of that sort of process this time around. Money gets sucked in. People take profits. They flow out into other areas of the economy, most notably land, probably. That's yeah. at least my view of it. Yeah, there's no and there's no kind of, you know, none of these well, maybe some of these coins earn a sort of a, have a steady, a steady stream of earnings to show yeah. you what a reasonable valuation is. Some of them may serve some economic function in which you know represents a certain amount of value, which then anchors uh, a reasonable valuation. But I think for a lot of them, they probably don't at the moment, or and may never, may never do. And so they're purely speculative. And so a price might increase, you know, ten, uh, ten thousand percent or a million percent or whatever it is that some of these things are doing. Um, uh, but that also sim also means that they could go di go the other direction as well. And, and that's generally what we see. And uh, I feel like we're getting to that point in, in crypto as well. It could be another six months from here or 12 months, but we're, we're nearly at 10,000 different cryptos and majority of them tend to do that. They'll go in this massive wave, pump all the money in, sucks all the money out. It usually goes into, say, Ethereum or Bitcoin or some stable coins, fiats. Yeah. And then we die off for a few years and we start the cycle again. But over time, Bitcoin is growing, more institutions coming in. This is sort of what we're seeing and hearing. 
and then maybe that becomes more in line with a commodity cycle but it's only 12 years old and commodity cycles from what i understand is approximately 25 30 years up 25 30 years down yeah they're not in straight line um no but yeah no. you're right yes no that and that's a possibility i mean i think if bitcoin ha takes that sort of thing then you know it will become part of the risk on risk off type of uh trade uh and so you know when when you know it, it might end up being the case that when the dollar goes up because there's a bit of fear then uh, bitcoin will go down and actually that's a possibility that we might see at the moment i think people are are a little worried if the dollar um, breaks above current resistance, um, it, whether that will send Bitcoin down from wherever it is now, 56,000 or whatever the price is at the moment. Yeah. And the same thing with the technology space. It's all like sort of NASDAQ and a lot of those stocks that boomed last year. Uh, many of them have broken some support levels. And I know that sort of plays in with the crypto space as well. Housing prices in Australia. So I'm on YouTube. You guys put in your questions today. I put out a post uh, several hours ago. Got a lot of comments in, over 40 comments. Housing prices in Australia are red hot. When will they cool? I think uh, that's all question. over the world. They're, I mean, they're pretty They're pretty red hot in a lot of countries. Um, I mean, are they, so just by, for information, are they red hot everywhere in Australia or is it? In Sydney, the feel Melbourne. is that it's in the majors. Definitely Melbourne, Sydney is getting hot again. Gold Coast, very hot. Brisbane, heating up. Yeah. Uh, I think Perth may be back on and then Adelaide yeah. is starting to move again as well. Right, so some of them are not, you probably would say they're not quite red hot. I mean, certain areas within them are starting yeah. to move and, and so on. I mean, Sydney and Melbourne seem to have this sort of heat at the start of every kind of expansion, as far as I can tell. What you tend to find, though, is, you know, as one particular area becomes simply unaffordable for people, they start to look at adjacent areas and so on. And so the cycle ripples out. Um, and also, um, you know, governments tell you where their next sort of area is going to be because they're building rail links and bus lines and so on. And they open up new areas. And so then money goes into those areas. And so overall, the thing is increasing, but it's not necessarily the same areas that are increasing uh, it's, at the same yeah. rate, it sort of ripples it out. Sounds like cryptocurrency. Uh, All comes into yeah. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then it sort of starts to ripple out into some smaller coins and smaller coins. Mm -hmm. They spike. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And 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 it's actually not a bad analogy because you know obviously the centre of, of Sydney, there's you know robust demand. You know that's where most of the economic activity is concentrated. Um, when you get to the outskirts of I don't know Darwin or something, you know there's probably not a huge amount of demand. Uh, for property there, I, with greatest respect to, to people in Darwin, um, and so and so, but what you tend to find during a land boom is that you know as prices rise, that induces builders to think, oh, well, actually, you know, you know, there's some good products, and there is probably some evidence that some people, some businesses are relocating to Darwin, and so you can get more for your money, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and so you have an overbuild, and the thing is that once those go over the top, um, you know, you know, you get a lot of developers who are basically very exposed because they've you know pumped a lot of money and they've borrowed a lot to do those developments and there's just no effective demand and, and a bit like you know the kind of what do you call them shit coins um you <laughs> yeah. know you 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 know they they have sucked in all the money uh, and they're you know practically worthless but people you know yeah people have paid a lot for them uh, and yeah. money flows out very quickly and never comes back or doesn't come back for a long time that, that's how I got burnt and I found Phil stuff was, uh, I think it was getting burnt just after that. It was mining towns in Queensland. And that okay. was, I was going on from the ripple effect of the major mining towns, looking for the smaller mining towns on the outside mm -hmm. of, of the major mining towns. And then yeah. nothing came from all of the, all of the news and the hype. And it, it literally skyrocketed and then it crashed. I looked back at the prices, it crashed solid 80 to 90%. Yeah. In those mining towns. Yeah, they went back to like yeah, this is, 20 yeah, or 30 so, grand. Well, look, I mean, it's, you know, I think, you know, if you're an investor for any length of time, see if you're really trying to push the edge, uh, you're going to get just, you know, there are scars that you have to, um, I think it's always a rite of passage. But, you know, <laughs> what I would say about that is, you know, some cities have a very large economic base and others do not. Um, and what you tend to find is that the biggest gains in the second half of the cycle tend to be in slightly smaller towns because, you know, businesses are relocating and so on. But you have to be quite careful as to what you're buying in those places and when you're buying it. Because, you know, the prospect of 
overdoing it is that much greater. I mean, they, you know, by way of example, they said in Ireland um, in 2007, so right at the peak of the property cycle last time, mm -hmm. Ireland was building enough houses to meet 30 years worth of demand. Um, so, I mean, you know, the, the extent of overbuilding can really go way over the top and no one seems to be paying attention to the aggregate picture until it's too late. So, so that's, you know, I think that's kind of my, my advice on, on that sort of thing. Still pay attention to the numbers. Will the inflation actually keep the house, uh, house prices soaring forever or will it crash like 2008? I think we kind of answered that. The prices um, will crash, but inflation. Again, look, it's not everything. It's not, I think, I think we need to be a bit careful that we, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that every single piece of real estate in Australia will boom for the next six years. I mean, generally. Okay. Even, yeah. Yeah. Even, even, um, I mean, we, we kind of talk about it. you, things ripple out, some areas become hot, some areas like even in a, during a boom, if, if there's a lot of apartment buildings going up, it's likely that people who own apartments are not going to see much of a price increase because if people are going to buy an apartment, they're going to buy the newest thing with the latest technology and then and the fanciest services and all that kind of stuff. And so the one that you own, which you bought two or three years ago, might not see much appreciation. So there is a subtlety to all this. It's not simply that everything will go up all the time. It's kind of hot at the moment. 2021, uh, yeah, people are thinking we should be crashing. Yeah. The question is, is it advisable to jump into the property market now as a first time, uh, first time buyer or wait for the crash in 20? 24, 26, and concentrate on building a building a bigger portfolio or deposit for that time. I mean, that is really more of a personal decision. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, like you, you don't have to. But, well, there's a there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. Um, one of the reasons why things are so hot now is because you know things were slow last year, and I, you know Australia that was things had slowed down a little bit when they had the banking commission um, mm -hmm. in 2018 and 2019, and so. And so I think there was a lot of pent up demand. We're seeing the same thing in London, uh, in, in the UK, because there was a lot of slow down, you know, when people when people were waiting to see how the Brexit process would play out. And so 2020 started really hot. And then, of course, we had the pandemic and it stopped again. And then 2021, it's red hot again. I mean, that's going to cool off a little bit. I mean, it can't, you know, people aren't just buying and selling houses all the time. And so, you know, you might see a bit of that post-pandemic stability comes back in and the, and the housing market cools off a little bit. Uh, you might want to wait for that. But of course, if you find something that you really like, then, then you should go for it. And the, other, the other way to do it, of course, is you could build a property portfolio as an investor and continue to rent uh, in a location that you like living in um, uh, and, you know, take advantage of the property market that way. And it actually might help a little bit with um, affordability because you have a bit more flexibility as to where you invest um, and you can might be able to find slightly cheaper places uh, and make your money go a bit further. So, um, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily recommend waiting till the end of the cycle and, and several years because, you know, property prices might increase very significantly between now and then. And even if they come down, they may not come down to the levels of where they Can't are really uh, at this yeah. point in time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember asking Phil that last year. I'm like, should we be waiting for it to go down further? Or, you know, now I was asking, I think, Kathy, you know, is it going to, with this heat, should we wait for the heat to come off? And it's kind of like, now is the time. You're never going to pick it exactly right. But we know with more certainty that the next four or five years are going to be pretty hot. So, right. yeah, now is like, not the bottom, but it's it's a good time. And more people are asking about sort of what do you see in terms of deflation or inflation over the next several years? Is there any way to any way for the Fed to stop QE without destroying the economy? Yes, uh, I think the Fed will start to taper things off. Uh, I don't know if it's doing quite the same amount uh, as it was last year. Um, I mean, really, what what the US is doing now is starting to invest in public services in a way that it hadn't over the last ten years. Uh, so if Joe Biden's um, was it two trillion, four trillion infrastructure plan gets passed, um, that's a different different nate. That's a different type of stimulus, and you know the Fed won't need to do as much as it has done. Uh, the Fed is more interested in trying to make sure that the banking system has liquidity so that it can lend money to businesses, essentially, or in 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 well, in reality, lend money so people can acquire mortgages. But um, you know 
that's kind of its its function. Um, the I think the the real the real action at the moment is going to be the levels of public investment in 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 infrastructure and social infrastructure like schools and healthcare facilities um, in making places more desirable. Um, uh, and that will take over the kind of stimulus effects. All right. So they, they're kind of, they're still printing money. Taxpayers will still have to pay it back, but it's going into infrastructure as opposed to giving it to the banks and that money sort of flowing into the stock market. Yeah. I mean, what, what the infrastructure will do is we'll push up land prices. Um, uh, and that's expected for the next few years. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it, it does, it does it to a certain extent flow into the stock market because of course, a lot of what companies own is real estate, uh, you know, their factories and their offices and their, their retail spaces and so on. And so that increases in value and that's reflected in higher stock prices. So their balance sheets are worth more. I, I want to read it out because I know there's a lot of people asking it, but it's any thoughts on a coming depression? Um, yes. There is a lot I of scare in the market. <laughs> there is a, a lot of scare that we should be having a depression this year or next year, especially what we were saying at the beginning of the video with Harry Dent. Sorry, I keep cutting you off. Harry Dent's 90% starting in June. We probably won't see it till 2022 because it takes time. Uh, he, he did say sort of like a 30, 40% for Australia, 50, 60% for the US, and then the stock market, 70 to 90%. So any thoughts on a coming depression? One thing I've noticed about Harry and, and, and a lot of commentators is they use, they toss around these terms as if, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're using these things precisely. They're not. I mean, depression means a period of several years where the growth of the economy is is well below its long term trend. Um, and so we don't tend to have many depressions. Um, if they mean a very sharp recession, well, we've obviously had one of those uh, last year. Um, Do you foresee uh, one in the next one, two, three years? No, no, no. We're, no. we're entering the second half of the cycle, and so, so we won't, we won't get a, a recession until the end of the decade. I mean, you know, you might have a quarter where the growth is low because, you know, businesses aren't buying inventory and the government isn't spending much money, etc. So you do sometimes get fluctuations like that, but that's not a depression. That's just, a, you know, a, a fluctuation in an overall economic cycle, which you get. You know you can get in any year the recession at the end of the cycle will probably be to a certain extent an economic depression um depending on how we respond to it and what else is going on at the time uh, but that's uh, some years off um can the and that stock will probably market... be that'll probably be in like 2027 ish well that's that's the you know ac according to the the kind of 18 year cycle yes now hmm. um there is the possibility that things may get so hot over the next few years that actually there's so much momentum behind the global economy um, that it continues going a bit longer. You know, I mean, I'm almost half expecting that. A bit because, longer rather than shorter. I think a lot of people are expecting it to be shorter. Well, right. But, you know, the, as I said, if the, the bo if the boom is bigger than, than we expect, then it will go on longer. Because longer. Yeah, wow. The, re the, re the reason is that, well, there's two reasons. One is um, this is probably the first cycle in history where both developing countries and developed countries are growing rapidly at the same time or have the potential to grow rapidly. Uh, you know, I mean, things may not. And it, also, we have to look at these things globally. It might be the case that the US and the UK might, be showing signs of slowing, but if China is going gangbusters and, and buying up lots of real estate and uh, Chinese banks are lending lots of money and Chinese demand for raw materials is continuing because they're still building out their country, um, there's a lot, still a lot of development to be done in China and in, you know, in India and in other parts of the world. I mean, these are bigger, collectively, these are bigger portions of the global economy than uh, advanced countries. And so that can keep things going, um, uh, and the you know the other the other thing is that uh, I know from reading history that it isn't easy to make forecasts. So just because I've sat here and said <laughs> it's twenty twenty six the peak, I mean something is going to happen to to make me you know at least for a time look a bit stupid. So so uh, and that might be one of them. That might be that um, that actually things go on a bit longer, or the land market peaks in twenty twenty six. And the stock market doesn't peak till 2028. 
And for those two years, people will be phoning me up and saying, well, you said 2026 and I, you know, I did this and I did that and, 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 and um, you know, it hasn't crashed. And, you know, the reality is that that's exactly what happened in the 1920s. So the land market peaked in the US in 1926 um, and, you know, prices were not going up. They were going down in some places, agricultural um, farmland prices were going down. Uh, but the bull market was so strong uh, that it didn't peak until uh, 1929. Um, uh, and so, you know, that is, you know, you, that is the possibility. This 18 year cycle was still intact. The, the, the property prices did peak 18 years after the previous cycle, but for some reason, and there's some historical reasons why that happened, the, the stock market bull market uh, continued on for another year or two. So that's it. I'm, I'm throwing out that as a possibility. Um, but no, I don't think it will be shorter. If anything, right. it will be than we're expecting. That's a good way to look at it. Uh, and I think most people see it as the other way around. They're expecting this to be shorter. They're expecting a crash and then a very long depression with the whole, you know, gold should be coming back and Bitcoin's taken over and uh, we've got to go back to the old days. It's, it's, it's quite it's, ingrained it's in the YouTube like space. People live in, it's almost like people live in parallel universes. I mean, I, when I look, pick up the paper, I mean, I see all this enormous development and potential and technology and you know we're rolling out green energy across the world i mean that's enormous amount of investment and you know elon musk is or uh, bezos is sending uh, rockets all over the place and they're coming back down and being reused and elon musk is supplying people with electric cars that can be paid for by bitcoin and you know have all these incredible developments um i just don't see how you call a depression personally but um you know you know, that's, you know, that I, I have my opinion. They have opinion. We'll see who's going to be right over the next few years. Well, we definitely know who sells more papers, the naysayers. Yeah, probably. That, a, I, I take it the next bit is, is not me. <laughs> <laughs> not you, no. Telling yeah. us that we've still got five more years of good times. All right. Uh, well, let, let's let's change tag. I think, okay, right. Time to, yeah. um, time to buy gold. Time to, uh, <laughs> uh, to sell your uh, penthouse in the center of Sydney to buy a place in, I don't know, where, where, where do people go these days? Is it Dubbo or something inland? Um, uh, it's time yeah, to buy shotgun. <clears throat> it's time to, you know, grow wheat uh, so you can feed your family and make sure you've got a sort of access to running water or something. Bury silver. Maybe, maybe, make sure you've got a lot of silver buried. Probably. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you'll be selling a lot more. Guys, uh, okay. if you made it this long through, I've been going for probably an hour and a bit. Let us know in the comments if you've got any questions because I'm sure Akil will come back on and chat with me. Hopefully we'll do a shorter one. If you've got news items that you want to talk about, I see a lot out there with things about the economy, depression, crash, and you know we talked about for the last hour. Let us know in the comments. Tag us in Twitter and we'll make sure we'll do a video on those as well to address those so that we can sort of dispel some of the, the fear in the market. Otherwise, I'm sure a lot of people will go through the next five years sort of hating themselves and believing more in that story as opposed to investing and making some money now, however they see fit, whatever works for their strategy. So yeah, you'll be happy to come on again. I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, absolutely. More than yeah. happy to. We'll, we'll try and do shorter videos after we've spoken for the first time. The money printing, that seems to be a big one. Can you just talk quickly on, we've said money printing, but the hyperinflation is another topic that, comes through the narrative a lot is there hyperinflation because we're seeing commodity prices skyrocket lumber and all the rest of them <laughs> yeah the, the foodstuffs and yeah lumber is the big one at the moment so is there hyperinflation yeah, there's, a, there's a housing boom going on it's construction and uh, and so on so um that's the reason you know demand for raw materials always pushes prices up and so you know come on i think commodity prices will have a good few years i mean they may not as I said, it won't be up for four or five years in a straight line. There will be peaks and troughs. And, you know, obviously high prices brings on extra supply, which then brings prices down again. But, you know, well, you know, you know the story better than I do. I think one of the reasons why people are worried about it is because they don't really understand, uh, with the greatest respect, um, how money works in an economy. Um, and so, I mean, you know, we can probably talk about this in a bit more detail another I time. I felt like we're going to unpack another whole... Yeah, yeah. Video on that, what I will say, topic. what I will yeah. say is that the government 
anytime the government spends money, it prints money, and then it might at some point choose to tax money back out of the economy. It's simply not the case that the government taxes you first uh, and then spends what it's taxed, and if it doesn't have enough, it borrows. Um, so governments are always, quote unquote, printing money to spend. Um, can they go over the top? Of course they can, but that depends rather on how much spare capacity there is in the economy. If you're, there's no spare capacity, then you're likely to create inflation. And if there is capacity and you are spending money in the right areas, you're investing in infrastructure and making things better, then you won't create inflation. You'll make your economy more productive. Um, uh, so, so, Do you think America is doing that well? America's infrastructure is appalling. America's got enormous capacity for, for, for um, infrastructure spending. I mean, four trillion is probably not enough, uh, frankly. I mean, obviously, if it spends four trillion next year, it will create enormous inflation because, um, because you know, there isn't enough capacity in the economy to absorb even you know even an economy as large as America's to absorb that amount. But it's a it's a four trillion package over ten years, I think. Um, okay. And so America has got more than enough um, capacity to absorb that, and it will, you know, it will become a more productive economy as a result, and it will become bigger. Um, you know, the the Trump tax cuts in in twenty eighteen were a stupid idea because you were, um, you know, you were where well, effectively you're taxing, you're untaxing rich people. Um, you weren't creating any sort of compensating kind of um, increased productivity of the economy uh, and it was also quite late in in a bull market so so while it pushed stock prices up it did very little for the u.s economy um so you know you governments can get it wrong but uh the biden plan for investing in infrastructure is not not one of those things not wrong yeah so as the market's going up you need to be taking some of that money back to pay for all the spending you did earlier on and start to save it's whereas trump's tax cuts were giving money back to people when there was so much money being circulated. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not, so it's not, you know, you're not taxing to, uh, to fill a deficit. So this idea of surplus and deficit is not quite right either, but yeah, I take, you know, okay. you, you regulate the money supply such that there's enough money for a productive economy for people to buy and sell things. Um, and so if you've got too much money in the economy, you, you will find inflation ticking up because too much money is chasing a certain level of goods and services and then you'd want to raise taxes or you might want to raise taxes to direct behavior in a certain area so you don't want you know highly polluting industries not you know paying some kind of compensation for the fact that they're sticking you know noxious gases into the atmosphere so that's another reason why you might raise taxes and direct it in certain areas um, so you don't you don't necessarily see the economy completely collapsing after this crash and us getting sort of wiped out for a long period of time. It, it does feel like it's building to that sort of expectation that we should have an extra long depression like we did after the 1920s. You can't really tell, um, it's a long way off, but from what you're seeing. Well, no, I think, I mean, look, the 1920s, the 1930s um, depression was really bad, partly because governments didn't act quickly enough and then they started erecting trade barriers uh, between them uh, and it kicked off a spiral and so on. It's not, you know, they, they there could have been a way that they they could have handled it such that we didn't have something quite so significant. Uh, but we have a diff we have a much more activist government now and it sees as one of its functions to step in during a, a major crisis. Uh, and so it's, you know, you may not get a very long depression even after 1926 or 1927 or whenever it is um but we won't we won't know there may be some reasons why it can't act then and then it a, a, a crisis could come uh bigger but it's a bit hard to speculate now as to how that will play out yeah okay we'll, we'll keep watching it into the peak of 2026 or a bit later yeah if i sorry so just to add to that if i were a betting yeah. man uh, and look maybe maybe just to counter some of the negativity that you're reading and seeing and in, in sure. the questions and so on. If I were a betting man, I think the level of technological development that is coming forward, and it's only really just getting started. The, the cryptocurrency story is only at the beginning. Self-autonomous vehicles is really only at the beginning. Green energy is really only at the beginning. New practices and it's all these different things, biotechnology, et cetera. 
it's probably the case that we're going to have a lot of new economic development to, as these technologies roll out, which, you know, quite possibly could last the entire rest of the century. And, and if that's the case, it could mean that economic depressions aren't very severe uh, for most of for most of the century, because, you know, there's so much new investment going in to build out the, the economy of the future. I mean, that's one possibility. And it's, to my mind, at least as likely as the other possibility that, you know, after the next crash, things get so bad that they don't recover for several years. That's true. I've never looked at it like that. But when you say it, that it's so crazy, because all of those things are talked about on the daily, how many of these new industries that are just booming. And then on the flip side, that's doom and gloom. And I'm just looking at other questions of uh, buy hard assets because hyperinflation is here. And it's like the te technology has just gone absolutely crazy. Electric vehicles, all this, is, like regardless of what people believe about climate change and whatnot, it's just that's where the money's pouring into and it's building a new society. Yeah. And, you know, the climate change debate is, I mean, I, I, I can't see it's really much of a debate personally. I mean, you know, the fact is that if you pollute the world, it's going to have yeah. some repercussions. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, as you say, it's that's not really relevant. The fact is, is that, you know, why wouldn't you build cleaner technology if you can? Um, why would we, you know, spew diesel fumes into the air if we can have electric cars, which can manage that process differently? Uh, but the, the point is, is that rolling out that energy infrastructure creates enormous jobs and enormous investment, uh, which is, you know, which is a great thing. Hyperinflation is probably not on the cards for this cycle. Well, or for any cycle. So, for any hyper, cycle. So, can so I, can I title the video that? I'm going to put yeah, that on the yeah. video. There is no. no so look, the, yeah, go on. Hyperinflation results from um, when an economy has a major supply shock. So, so you know, Zimbabwe is the example that a lot of people size. Yeah, well, the government is printing all this money, but the, the fact is, is that you know, and and you know, I'm not going to get into the sort of politics of it because clearly that's is very complicated. But um, they took farms away from professional farmers, essentially, uh, and in you know, Zimbabwe, in to redistribute yes, redistribute yeah. land, and so the largely agricultural economy lost most of its capacity. Uh, and so you had a government printing money on an economy that didn't have the same uh, productivity as it did prior to the process of land redistribution. The same thing happened in Germany in the 1920s. I mean, you had enormous reparations. The government had to print a lot of money to facilitate that. But Germany lost a large amount of its territory to France as well. Um, and so it's when you have these major uh, uh, supply shocks to an economy that you get hyperinflation. But, you know, government enacting stimulus uh, during an economic crisis is not the conditions for uh, hyperinflation on the, uh, of themselves. But, gotcha. you know, I, I'm not sure why people suddenly go to hyperinflation straight away when they're, you know, everyone's basically being told to stay at home um, and, you know, for, for a temporary uh, amount of time. And this will keep us going until we can emerge from it. Um, so I, well, I think, it, you know, it was the money printing, it was like 30 percent in one year compared to the entire cycle of yeah, money. Well, it's true, but but thirty year the thirty thirty percent money printed creation, in one year, yeah, yeah. But but when people were basically told to, you know, we, the economy was frozen temporarily. It's it's also the case. It's the one. I mean, you we will get inflation. I'm not I'm not, I'm not being dismissive. Hyperinflation is a particular economic phenomenon which occurs uh, for specific reasons. People you know toss around these terms as if. You know, you know, they're interchangeable. We will, of course, get in inflation. We'll get inflation because uh, during a land boom, things go over the top. Banks lend too much money um, uh, for real estate. There's not a corresponding increase in production uh, to compensate for all that money printing that private banks are doing. Uh, and so we will get inflation. In the UK, they said that in aggregate, people saved £240 billion last year while they were sitting at home. I mean, you've never had a recession where people have been able to increase their level of savings. A lot of that money is going to go into the economy this year, and that will create inflation because, you know, the economy isn't quite as big as it was at the start of 2020. So we, and, you know, we are seeing a bit of inflation in terms of food prices and, you know, a pint of beer now is shocking. Um, I mean, it was already shocking uh, 
uh, at the start of 2020. It's even more shocking because, you know, a lot of hospitality uh, outfits, they can't accommodate as many people uh, and they're trying to recover some of their really difficult times. And so they've put prices up. So there is a certain level of inflation that's already happening, but hyperinflation is, is, is you know, something else entirely. All right. Speaking of food and drink, I'll wrap it up here. Last question was okay. pineapples on pizza. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, I, Definitely I spent, not. Too, much time, I spent yeah. too much time in Italy for that. All right. There you had it. No pineapples on pizza. Beers are too expensive in the UK and you will not see hyperinflation in this cycle and probably not in any cycle in our lifetimes. Yeah. Unless those things that, um, I'm unless those them. things with the disclaimers of course yeah unless yeah. we see the supply shocks which if we go into another conversation there people believe the supply shocks happened when they closed all the borders down and we couldn't get anything from china is that a supply uh, well, shock so, well no so when if say if say um uh, you know i don't know northern territory decided it wanted to be an independent nation and uh, and so on or chi the chinese use, use western australia chinese took over western australia yeah, yeah western australia wants to separate yeah yes Oh, the Chinese invade and, and annex Western Australia. Um, right. It's that sort of thing. Or And then there's a sort of a treaty which says, fine, that's forever going to be a, a province of China. And, uh, and you know, it's, the, it's those are the conditions where you start to get sort of hyperinflation or you go sort of totally crazy and um, uh, for whatever reason, but not when you're stimulating economy out of a, a major sort of recession. So. All right. With that said, thank you very much, mate. Stay on the line. I'll chat to you after this, but I just wanted to say goodbye for the, the guys here. We'll, we'll be back on. And I am trying to promise a shorter video with updated property, <laughs> property share market, economics information. Uh, join, we'll go across. I've got the links in the description down below for property share market economics for their boom bust uh, bulletin for guys just starting out to learn about the cycle so the link's down below for that otherwise you can go to the website as well check it out i kill you're on twitter property share market economics is on twitter and so i'll leave those links down there as well so follow along uh i'll say thanks once again like the video up if you want to see more of it youtube subscribe and all that sort of good stuff and of course the property share market economics youtube channel that's also down below i'll cross to you thank you akil Thank you very much for having me. Enjoyed it. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Until next time, have more fun to get more done.